Hey, it's Jeff Kinley and welcome to Vintage Truth. I'm so excited that you've joined me here today. We're going to be studying God's Word for a whole nother year together. And I'm so excited that you've tuned into this podcast. This is uh, we're, we're closing in on 500 podcasts here uh, in just a, a several podcasts from now. And I'm so excited to, to see what God has done to take this little podcast that I started about five years ago and the Lord has just exploded it. It's in over a hundred, well over a hundred countries uh, across the world. And I don't know how many downloads we have. I, I'm, I'm sure it's either approaching right around a million or more than a million. And uh, many of you are, uh, you're, you're binge listening or, or watching, <coughs> excuse me, this podcast. And so it just makes me feel very humbled and uh, that you would uh, join me in studying God's word together. But here's what's cool. Uh, so many other things are happening right now that uh, I think it's time at the beginning of the year just to kind of calibrate, get our minds set, uh, make sure that that we're on the same page that God is. And I want to begin with some really good news because so many things are happening in the world today that are so dark, depressing, depraved, uh, and it's hard sometimes to wrap your mind around it, much less to get your emotions on board uh, with what's happening. And so I want to start today by just talking about four things that never change, uh, four things that you can always stand on, uh, that can always support you, that you never have to worry about the ground uh, crumbling beneath your feet. And they all have to do with God and his incredible commitment to you. As we head into a world that is uncertain, a world that is always changing, the news changes, the government changes, the culture is changing, our own hearts are fickle and unreliable, uh, but God is our rock. He is our constant source of security. So I want to talk about these uh, changes that go on in the world, uh, but that God doesn't change. I mean, think about it. Fashion changes, uh, hairstyles change, friends change. Uh, you have to change uh, your, your oil in your car. Uh, you have to change your gasoline. Everything changes, but God uh, never changes. And so uh, because we know the world is constantly changing, uh, that causes us to want to sink our teeth, our spiritual teeth, as it were, into something that never, never alters. And so these are just four facts, four things, I think, that will be very encouraging to you. They're all from the book of Romans, all from chapter 8. So I'm going to be drawing from uh, uh, verses 31 and following here. Here's the first thing uh, that will never change. Uh, Romans 8, 31 says, What then shall we say to these things? Since God is for us, who is against us? The first thing that never changes, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, this one fact will always be the same. God is for you. Now, this is a far cry from what you hear prosperity gospel teachers teach today, that God uh, wants you healthy, that he'll always make you uh, financially prosperous and things like that, uh, and, and always healthy. God never says that. But he is for you in the sense that, that God has sacrificed his own son. In fact, the verses uh, that follow this, we're going to talk about more about, that it says, he, did not, he who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? And I don't know if, if you picture yourself like this or not, but as a child of God, if you have a child, if you have a son or a daughter or a baby, infant, whatever, you're for them. You want you you really want uh, to be on their on their side. You want to be on their team. You want to defend them. Um, and so I just have a couple of questions here that I think are good diagnostic questions to help us get our minds in sync with what God says about Himself and about us. How about this? Do you ever picture God as cheering you on? Uh, how about this? Do you ever see God in heaven in your mind applauding you? Do you imagine God smiling? when he watches you live your life? Or do you always see him as, as someone who's frowning upon you? Uh, do you imagine God who is always on your back or on your side? This verse says God is for us. Is God in heaven waiting for you to disobey so that he can have an excuse to punish you? Or is God like a father who can't wait uh, to do something good for you because he's for you, this verse says. Uh, do you view God like an intimate father, like a daddy, and maybe some someone that you 
that you feel emotionally tied to. Why? B because he's for you. God is not against you. If, if he is your father and you are his child, he is, he is wanting to help you. And we'll see more about that in just a minute. Uh, do you see God as someone who walks beside you, ready to pick you up when you fall? Or a God who wants you to stay down there so that he can tell you what you did wrong and make you feel even worse for it? Listen, the Holy Spirit convicts our hearts when we fall. But God's desire is to help us get back up again. You know why? Because God is for us. The whole point of the Holy Spirit convicting us of sin is so we can get back up again and get back into the race. So don't stay down. When you get knocked down, you can't stay down. The devil will tell you to stay down. Your own sinful heart will tell you to stay down. But God is for you. He wants you to, to get back up again. Do you see God as someone who's standing in your corner? Do you see yourself as his child, uh, someone who is uh, protected, spiritually speaking, uh, that God loves you so much that he's already sealed and secured your salvation? In fact, he gave you his own Holy Spirit so that you would feel that that security. You would know that security. Ephesians 1, 13, 14 says that, that the Holy Spirit is a promise to us of our future inheritance and that we are sealed in him for the day of redemption. It's an airtight ceiling that we get. Not ceiling, but a ceiling around us. Uh, we're sealed up and we're protected by him. Uh, do you think of yourself, therefore, as someone who is secure? That you don't worry about your eternal destiny. You don't worry about whether or not you're going to make it to heaven. N nobody makes it to heaven. Heaven, like salvation, is a gift. And God gives it to those who place their trust in Jesus Christ. Do you hear God applauding you in heaven? He will never turn on you. He, was, he is always loyal to you. In other words, you're not going to wake up one day like that unpredictable parent that you may have grown up with and not know which one you're going to get when they come home from work. You're not going to wonder about that. God is not fickle. Uh, God is not... Um, He's not unpredictable in the sense that that we never know if his character is going to change. No, he's always the same yesterday, today, and forever, <clears throat> the book of Hebrews tells us. So one fact that you can sink your teeth into, that you can rely on, is that God is for you. And it says it right there in your Bible. Here's a second unchanging fact, is that God wants to give you good things, good things. Now, when we say good things, we don't mean that, that God wants to give you a mansion or a Ferrari or, you know, a, a, an extra house somewhere. Not, not necessarily. Th those are not the kind of things we're talking about, material things. Uh, God wants to give you good things that will help you become more like Jesus Christ. The next verse says this, He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how will he not also with him uh, freely give us all things? Then when Jesus talked about if, if a child asks for an egg, will the father give him a, a serpent? You know, uh, if he asks for bread, he won't get the father won't give him a stone. He said then he said, if you being evil know how to give good gifts to your children. Now, let's think about that for a second. All of us as parents, we're, we're just sinners. We're evil. But we know how to give good gifts to our kids. Right. We know what's best for them. And, and he's making an argument here from the greater to the lesser. He says, if, if God did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all. So Christ died for us all. If God in Christ is the greatest gift that the father could have ever given to us. If he did that, what makes you think all the lesser gifts are, are not going to be given to us? It's almost like if you're... <clears throat> If your father or your husband or wife or whatever handed you a hundred dollar bill and just said, here, go buy something for yourself. And then you say something like, well, can I have a, like a penny extra? They're not going to say, no, no, I can't afford a penny. Yeah, they're going to give you the penny. If they gave you the greater gift, they'll certainly give you the smaller gift. And God is saying, if I gave you the greatest gift in the universe, what makes you think I won't freely? It says, with him freely give us all things. 
And those all things there are all the things that we need to enjoy the salvation that we have been given and to experience the sanctification and the life change that God has promised to us and to expect the ultimate completion of our salvation in the end. So God wants to give us things to, to enjoy our salvation, uh, to experience our sanctification, and to expect the ultimate uh, result of our, of our sanctification and salvation, which is glorification in heaven. He's going to freely give us all those things. Jesus is the Jesus is not the, the icing on the cake. He's the cake. And all these other things come as a part of the benefit package. Many times we think that God uh, has a plan for our lives that, that is meant to make us miserable. And, you know, we go through hardship in life, hardship that we create, hardship that the world creates, hardship that Satan creates, and just life in general. And the fact that God uses those things, yes, but God is not out to make us miserable. Uh, he's out to help us find uh, and lead us into the contentment and the fulfillment that is only found by those who know Jesus Christ as their personal uh, Lord and Savior. And, and I think that, you know, sometimes we, we, we have this uh, kind of idea that if, if I like something a lot, if I'm, if I'm really into it, then it must be bad. You know, as if God can't uh, use uh, things in our lives to lead us towards Him. For example, uh, Psalm 37 verse 4 says this, it says, Delight yourself in the Lord, and He will give you the desires of your heart. And the verse is not saying that if we just we just simply follow God, then then we can just you know want anything and it'll appear. However, as we are following God, you know what happens as we delight ourselves in the Lord. What happens? Our desires change, and and I love what John Piper said one time. And and it sounds like an oversimplification, but if you but if you steward this sentence properly, it really makes sense. He said. Love God and do as you please. Love God and do as you please. Not do as you please, but love God and do as you please. Because you see, if our desires, our devotions, our dedications are focused in on Jesus, we're going to find that our, we're not going to want the things that would take us away from that focus. We're going to want the things that are in concert, in harmony, in sync, uh, with loving Jesus. And so love God and do as you please. So, so for example, if you're following God passionately, then, and you have a desire for something, you feel like God's leading you to something, that's probably a godly desire. Now you can check it and put some checks and balances and seek wise counsel if you need to. But if it's something that's in your heart, why would you say that didn't come from God if you are truly following him and truly loving him and truly delighting yourself in him? So I love what it says uh, in uh, Isaiah chapter 49 in verse 15. It says, can a woman forget her nursing child and have no compassion on the son of her womb? Even these may forget, but I will not forget you, God says. Uh, later in verse 16, it says, Behold, I've inscribed you on the palms of my hands. On the palms of my hands. God is indelibly. Uh, and I think this applies not, not just to Israel, but to uh, true, with true believers today. That God has put you like a tattoo almost on the inside of his hands. Uh, Jeremiah 29, 11 says, I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare, not for calamity, to give you a future and a hope. Now that, that original promise was not made to believers. It wasn't made to the church. It was made to Israel. But the principle of that verse is still true, that, that God has good plans for us. Uh, he's not trying to make us miserable. And then think about Romans 12, uh, chapter 12, verse 2. It says uh, that as we uh, submit ourselves to God by the mercies of God. We present our bodies a living and holy sacrifice. It says that you may prove or demonstrate what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. So God's will, the good things he wants for us are good things. They're acceptable things. They're perfect things. And we should embrace those things. So if God loved us so much to give us his son, then he wants to give us good things in this life. And those good things we get to enjoy uh, spiritually speaking, and, and physical things as well, but we just can't claim those physical things, uh, but we do enjoy them as blessings as they come our way. So God wants to give you good things. Think of God as being a good, good 
Lord, a good, good father. And he really is. Here's the third thing. Number three is that God will never, ever condemn me. It says in verses 33 and 34, who will bring a charge against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is he who died, yes, rather, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who also intercedes for us. Have you ever worried that you might have lost your salvation? Well, you probably have at some point. Maybe it's a sin you committed. Maybe it's a sin you committed again and again and again. Uh, maybe it's a thought that you had. Maybe it's a, a habit or a pattern of life that you're trying to get out of. And, and you just wonder if you've lost your salvation. Look, I, I love what John MacArthur says here. He says, if it were possible for you to lose your salvation, you would. I mean, we would all lose our salvation if it were possible for that to happen. You know why? Because we sin a lot. And we're fallen, uh, frail, fragile uh, human creatures. Uh, how about this? Have you ever wondered if if God has maybe changed his mind about forgiving your sins? Or maybe, you know, he forgave sins up to a point, uh, but he's, he's kind of retroactively gone back and says, I'm not going to forgive any of those sins anymore. Uh, have you ever been torn apart by guilt from sin? I have. And you probably have too if you're a believer. Have you ever stayed away from God because you're afraid of how he would react uh, to your sin. You know, a lot of people stay away from fellowship with other believers because they're not doing well spiritually. Because being with other believers is a reminder of how bad they're doing. Because by comparison, they're not doing as well as other believers. Well, guess what? All believers struggle in some way and in various forms and various degrees. But here's the deal. When you go and you're with other believers, it's like plugging in your phone to recharge it. If you if you come with a low battery, as a, if you're a phone and you have a low battery, and there may be reasons why your battery's low, and you may have used up too much time watching TikTok videos. You know, yeah, you probably shouldn't have done that. But watch this. That doesn't mean your battery is just go die somewhere. Plug it in. Plug it in and get recharged. I mean, that's the logic here. But as believers, sometimes we think we want to stay away from the Bible, we'll stay away from prayer, stay away from fellowship, uh, stay away from godly influences or even watching programs like this. Why? Because we think that, that it's going to further condemn us. No. Remember the point we said at the beginning, when you fall down, you get up? Well, that's what God wants to do. And God will never condemn you. You know why? Because Romans 8, 1 says, there is therefore now no condemnation. No condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So God exhausted his, all of his condemnation against you on Jesus at the cross. That's why he said it's finished. That's why he says in 2 Corinthians 5.21, he made him who knew no sin, sin, that we might become the righteousness of God uh, in him. And so when we are, are overcome with our humanity, uh, with our sinfulness, uh, with our poor choices, and we all get there, right? Just know that even then, and that's when you really need it, by the way. You really need this point <laughs> in those times. You're still not condemned. You know why? Because the Bible says that Jesus Christ, in Hebrews chapter 7, verse 25, I think, that Jesus Christ ever lives to intercede for us. Do you know what that means? That means that as long as Jesus exists, he will symbolically plead your case before the righteous father. Guess how long Jesus is going to live? He's God. So infinity. So guess how long your salvation gets to last because he's pleading for you? Infinity. He will never, ever, ever condemn you. And you will never be lost. You will always be his and you will always be found. Now God will discipline you as a father disciplines his son or daughter. But he will never condemn you because the condemnation was exhausted on Jesus on your behalf. And that's really, really uh, good news. He's already condemned uh, his son. And so we say sometimes, well, maybe there's just a little bit of condemnation left. Nope. God the Father would have to apologize to Jesus, his son, for his sacrifice and, and reject his sacrifice if he ever has to condemn you in any way. And so 
You will never be condemned, and that will never, ever change. Here's a fourth thing, and I love this. God will never, ever stop loving you. He'll never stop loving you. How do we know this? Let's go back to Romans. Beginning in verse 35, it says, Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or the sword? Just as it is written, for, for your sake we've been put to death all the day long. We were considered as sheep to be slaughtered. But in all these things, we, are over, we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, or any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. There is nothing that you can do theoretically or actually that will ever stop God's love from being on you. He'll never stop loving you. And guess what? He's, he's never going to love you any less, and he's never going to love you any more because he already loves you perfectly. And this list that Paul gives us here is, is so beautiful. I mean, how about death? Well, that No. How about anything in life? Fill in the blank, he says. I don't care what it is. How about some demons coming down and, and infiltrating your world? Is that going to separate you from God's love? No. Uh, he says, uh, what about um, princi principalities, angels, uh, things that are happening in your life right now? Then he says, things that are going to happen in your life. You don't have to worry about any future thing that can ever come in and, and unplug God's love towards you. It just can't happen. Why? Because it's dependent upon God himself and upon God's choice of you and his elective love of you and upon the death of Jesus and what Jesus accomplished and upon the resurrection and the fact that he ascended and he's at the right hand of the Father and he's pleading for you right now. God can't stop loving you. He just can't. And he always will, and he'll do it perfectly, and he'll do it uh, unconditionally. So what if I'm a liar? Well, you mean like Abraham? You say, what if I'm a deceiver like Jacob? Or what if, what if you're a, an adulterer like David? What if you fall into that? What if you fall into being just a pleasure seeker, a fun seeker like Solomon? You drift away for a while. Will you come back? Yes, you will. Or what about if you're a rebel like Jonah? What about if you're a, a cocky, big mouth braggart like Peter? Uh, what if you're an angry glory hound like John? Uh, what if you're a uh, someone who's an impatient workaholic like Martha or a, a doubter like Thomas or a sin struggler like Paul? You think God's going to still love you? It says here, nothing can separate us from the love of God. And all we have to do when we're thinking about whether or not God really loves us like he used to, you know, like during those times we were doing really good, he really, really loves us a lot. I always look at the cross. Uh, the cross will always be the indicator of God's love for you and what happened there. If you can go back in time and stop Jesus from dying on the cross for your sins, okay, maybe you might be able to make a case for God not loving you somehow, but that's already happened. It's history. It's fact. It's written in the book, and it's written for your benefit. So always look at the cross. And Jesus wants you to, to, to look at him, and the Father wants you to look at his son hanging on that cross, bleeding, dying, suffering uh, just for you. So can anything remove God's love from you? Well, according to this verse, no. And, and maybe sometimes you just need to hear God say it to you right here from the Word, right in your spirit, that He loves you. I was speaking um, in Dallas, Texas one time, and it was I was traveling, I was alone, and, and I was just uh, experiencing just, I don't know, just travel blues. And I remember it was early one morning, I was about to go speak somewhere, and I think it was at Dallas Seminary at their chapel, and and I was at a Starbucks there in a neighborhood there in, in Dallas, and I was having some coffee, and I just felt overcome uh, with just my inadequacy and just my sense of, wow, you're just a guy. It's really all you are. You're, you're just a, a human. And I got into my rental car and I turned on the radio and there was a a, a well-known uh, Bible teacher that was on there. And, and he was just speaking and he just said this. He said, 
sometimes you just need to hear the father say, I love you. And he said, maybe you need to hear that right now. And sitting in that car, that was the one thing I needed to hear. Because you know what? My message was prepared. I was ready to go. I was dressed up, ready to step into that pulpit and speak to those seminary students. But in my heart, I just needed to hear God say, hey, Jeff, I really do love you and I always will. And maybe you need to hear that today. Maybe you need to hear God call your name in your spirit, in your heart, and just remind you of the fact that not only do I love you, but I will always love you. And that'll never change. You know, people, their love for us, eh, it's like a thermometer. It goes up and down sometimes, right? But God's love is constant. It's consistent. And it's based on his own character. So those four things, I hope, are an encouragement to you. Uh, just the fact that God is for you, that God wants to give you good things, that God will never condemn you, and that God loves you. And that, again, will never, ever change. My friends, this world is about to be inundated with a lot of change. And the closer we get to the return of Jesus Christ, the more rapid and accelerating are the signs of the times going to be. Culture is going to be in, in an upheaval. Uh, and your world, perhaps, uh, could be rocked. But you need to know that you stand upon the solid rock. Uh, the Lord is your rock. Uh, he is your stable ground. And as Psalm 46 says, even though the earth itself should change beneath our feet, we know that God will never change and he'll never, ever stop being who he is for you. So take that to heart as you begin this 2024 and as we head into the year together, I hope you'll tell other friends about the Vintage Truth podcast. You can find out more about uh, my, our ministry, about uh, what's going on on uh, jeffkinley.com. There'll be an opportunity for you to sign up for my weekly newsletter just to get encouragement. And that's really all this ministry does is a ministry of biblical encouragement and equipping, uh, helping you become the person that God wants you to be. And uh, look, there's also a place that you can find out where I'm going to be speaking. Maybe I'm coming to your part of the country. I'm going to be traveling across uh, the world uh, and also across the country uh, this coming year. So I hope maybe uh, we'll have some time together. Maybe we can meet. I've also got a new book that's coming out uh, this summer. I'm very excited about. <laughs> You're going to really love this book. And uh, I'll tell you more about that in some upcoming episodes. But again, thanks for joining me here on A Vintage Truth. And I pray that God would communicate these four unchanging truths about himself because he himself will never change. I'll talk to you next time. God bless.